particularly related to the talk I'm going to give today, but if any of you are interested in checking out a copy, I've got some here. Okay, so the talk I'm going to give is perhaps slightly misnamed. Uh, what it's really going to be is something of an overview um, of an argument with a short anthology of art installations that are addressing this issue, so it will be a bit disjunctive to fit in with the time. But the overall concern is this question of reproducibility. There with the That's a teaser for you to read. Okay. In his nineteen eighty four novel New Romancer, William Gibson coined the term <coughs> matrix and cyberspace to designate a broad conception of the new data sphere emerging in tandem with ideas about virtual reality and global computer networks. The matrix was conceived as a mass consensual hallucination. I've always been fascinated by the way in which Gibson insists on it being consensual. A mass consensual hallucination, a kind of metaphor machine for producing a graphic representation of data abstracted from the banks of every computer in the human system. Unthinkable complexity. Lines of light ranged in the non-space of the mind, clusters and constellations of data, like city lights receding. In Gibson's conceptualization, the critical mass of accumulated data gives rise to a kind of quantum weirdness, an autonomous evolutionary process towards ever increasingly ubiquitous forms of AI, artificial intelligence. Like an imploding neutron star, this process has a certain ineluctable character. It occurs with the nominal catalyst of human agency at first, more or less all by itself. Like Darwin's biological materialism, Gibson's matrix evolves with only the illusion of a grand design. AI is depicted in broadly humanistic terms, psychological and sexual, but ultimately its purpose is nothing but evolution itself. At the time New Romancer was published, the interest in artificial intelligence had been steered primarily towards robotics and gaming. Gibson's Matrix was more of a throwback to the sorts of ideas contemporary with Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick's HAL in 2001, A Space Odyssey. And this was released back in 1968. In 1984, GPS was still purely military and the World Wide Web was a decade away. Like the Matrix, the public face of robotics was broadly humanistic. The problem of general intelligence had always been less about grasping what intelligence is than in how it can be represented to humans. In Gibson, a frequent fallback is gender. Elements of the Matrix marry and give birth to more evolved forms. Its processes are intersected by libidinous drives as much as by the operations of higher reason. Well, the basic premise here is that humanity is a catalyst for the evolution of technical artifacts emerging from a parasite host relation towards a godlike autonomy of purpose. Man in the service of the machine, but also man as technologically co evolving. The machine as a symbiotic means of abstracting man from environmental, which is also to say biological, dependence. As humanity evolves itself, it also reconceives of itself, consciously or otherwise, as that embryonic mass from which an ideal artificial intelligence is to be born, reenacting its own creation myth in reverse, becoming God. This is hardly a new idea. The myth of the demiurge, the maker of man, and by declensions man, the maker of golems, robots, Frankensteinian monsters, it is the ancient dream of a detachable autonomous ego, capable of imbuing inorganic matter with the characteristics of intelligence or intelligent design. 
a dream which, in a type of Freudian reprise to the aspirations of reason, has always been accompanied by the perverse fantasy of the rise of the bionic genital. From the very beginning, the concept of mind has evoked visions of bondage and ideas of subjectification that find a sexualized expression. The procedural logics of rationalism are like ritually entrained fetish scenarios, bodies as virtual hardware stripped out and hacked back into the collective gender cortex. If the golem represents the crude duality of the artificial body in bondage to reason, Fritz Lang's 1927 film Metropolis, for example, establishes the aesthetic sublimation of this duality in the figure of the fetish machine. The first thing we notice about the golem is the immaculate nature of its conception, a thing of mud and cabalistic mumbo codework, the shem placed in its mouth or the emeth written on its forehead, but still immaculate, motherless, like Adam. The thing is such, this ding an sich, and its creator, the archetypal Frankenstein, the mad rabbi, the monotheistic god. Or like sex sexless Athena, born fully fledged from the forehead of Zeus, armor clad, a type of vestal warrior in the cause of pure reason. The golem is all brawn, Athena all brains. But that isn't the be all of this particular trope. There are other binaries. The detached autonomous phallus, for example, and the mechanized vagina, the bionic man of the future and the bionic woman or fembot, something out of pre-feminist antiquity dressed up with futuristic bells and whistles, a sex machine with a dodgy thousand-year warranty, like some hydraulic vagina dentata. You get your hard on and your castration anxiety wrapped up in one package. Add them together, and you end up with that most utopian of all male fantasies, intelligence, beauty, and insatiable desire to fuck. It's doubtful, however, that this fantasy is fully reciprocated in the figure of the mechanized human dildo, that complex bit of sublimated libido we find in Gustav Meyrink's 1915 symbolist rendition in The Golem, or the not-so-complex one we find in Thomas Pynchon's rendering of The Rocket Man in Gravity's Rainbow. In the hands of Mary Shelley, this man-monster becomes a manifestation of its creator's sexual guilt. It's not simply a rampant phallus, but a reviled creature built of offended sensibilities. Not simply a gravity-defying superman, but the apotheosis of what is all too human. Or as the Tyrell Corporation in Ridley Scott's 1982 film Blade Runner has for its slogan, more human than human the edible desire to become its creator. The phallic trajectory of this desire is a constant feature of the Golem myth. At the beginning of Meyrink's novel, its protagonist, Athanasius Pernath, finds himself accidentally wearing a stranger's hat, and immediately his entire being rigidifies, becomes trans-like, trans-like guided by a convulsive tension as, as if he'd been transformed into a kind of mindless prophylactic engorged with the libido. This is Pernath's channeling of the eponymous Gollum. As the French philosopher and sometimes pornographer Georges Bataille evokes, uh, evokes with regards to a comparable trance-like experience in the tomb of Louis XIII, with the metaphoric implications of Pernas' state of made explicit. I entered a state of torpor wherein I suddenly felt myself becoming an erect penis. The intensity of my conviction rendered it difficult to deny. The previous day I had the same kind of violent feeling, the feeling that I was a tree and without being able to oppose the idea in the darkness, my arms extended themselves as branches. The idea of being, my body, my head, a large hardening penis was so crazy that I felt like laughing. The comical idea even came to me that so hard an erection, the entire body tensed as a hard tail, had no other point than orgasm. Now the story of Rabbi Love and the, and the Golem comes to us as a retelling of the immaculate father-son progeniture of the Old Testament, 
the liberatory fantasy of the man-made god as counterpoint to that of the enslaved phallus. As a species of machine, just imagine that genitals can be controlled, brought under the spell of organized labor, disciplined according to a schedule of productivity. Revisiting the technological context of the post-enlightenment, we can recognize in this the conventional narrative of the domination of a disembodied reason of a bodily and collective libido, for which the reproductive function of the genitalia is first and foremost a rationalization mediated by this figure of the golem. The autopoetic potential of the golem machine to begin to think for itself nevertheless adverts to a dilemma where the escaped golem represents a nightmare scenario of a mindless slave revolt, a veritable zombie geddon of disembodied genitals ranging abroad under an autonomous motive force, running amuck but essentially dumb, Lang's metropolis, for industrial proletariat in process of seizing the means of production itself in full knowledge of what they're doing, rationalism's ultimate nightmare. Now, the dominant phallocentrism of this allegory invites still further critique, one whose trajectory describes a forced feedback from Metropolis to the Wachowski's more recent 1999 reworking of Gibson's Matrix. And it's interesting for those of you who remember that film, uh, that the only female hacker character is this sort of latex fetish doll trinity. Now in the mid 80s and early 90s, during that period in which the internet entered popular consciousness but hadn't yet become the commodified space it is now, a new wave of artists and theorists emerged in tandem with Gibson's fictional explorations of the Matrix. In 1983, Donna Haraway began writing a cyborg manifesto, a rejection of humanist distinctions between animal and machine and biology and gender. The cyborg, a radical form of theorized and fabricated hybridization of machine and organ organism harks back to the constellations of Deleuze and Guattari's desiring machines as described in their 1972 investigation of capitalism and schizophrenia called Anti-Oedipus. The cyborg is, in Haraway's words, the illegitimate offspring of militarism and paternal capitalism, not to mention state socialism. Its autonomy, however, serves to render the paternal inessential in a movement that reinscribes and recodes Old Testament, the Old Testament sublimation of the mother. With its rejection of the paternalistic Oedipal creation myth, Haraway's cyborg is very much the contrary of the traditional golem figure. The cyborg, she concludes, does not dream of community on the model of the organic family, the cyborg would not recognize the Garden of Eden, it is not made of mud, and cannot dream of returning to dust. Now emerging from this intersection of cybernetics, philosophy, and gender critique, cyberfeminism was a term first coined in 1991 by Sadie Smith, the co-founder with Nick Land of the Cybernetic Culture Research Institute at Warwick University and the Australian artist collective VNS Matrix, comprised of Josephine Stars, Julianne Pierce, Francesca de Rimini, and Virginia Barrett. In reply to both Gibson and Haraway, VNS Matrix published a cyber, man cyber feminist manifesto for the 21st century, in which they set out the terms for a project for attacking the patriarchy within its bases of power, the creation of rules for communication, and the exchange of information employing slogans like, we are the modern cunt, the clitoris is the direct line to the matrix. A VNS matrix, VNS matrix took issue with Gibson's hyper-masculinized cyber jocks and the transplanetary military industrial data environment they were shown to inhabit, along with the highly caricatured nature of gender and ethnic types in Gibson's novels. In a review of VNS Matrix's 1991 multimedia installation, All New Gen, code poet and networker Mez Brees wrote, Gibson's novels are essentially revamped detective thriller novels, which employ weird plot divergences and characters caught up in the Matrix, 
a term commonly interchanged for cyberspace. When the Gibson character jacks into the Matrix, donning obligatory headgear and virtual reality gloves as he does so, the cowboy, for inevitably the hero is mostly male, has to battle a corporate entity and regain his position as an information paragon. He ultimately achieves this aim, albeit in a convoluted fashion, and reinstates his own hero status. This template of the machismo cyber jock completes as a free-to-occupy agenda interstice, despite the prevailing machismo of hacker culture. Now, writing on the genesis of Anonymous and Volzek, Palmy Olson, in her recent book, We Are Anonymous, noted this contradiction with regard to a seeming prevalence of real-life transgendering among long-term habitualities of sites associated with anonymous like 4chan. This is what she writes. There was not much research on hackers who were trans, but plenty of anecdotal evidence suggesting the number of tra transgender people regularly visiting 4chan or taking part in hacker communities was disproportionately high. One reason may have been that as people spent more time in these communities and experimented with gender bending online, they could more easily consider changing who they were in the real world. Lines between the online and offline selves could become blurred and some people in these communities were known to talk about gender as just another thing to hack on. If people are already used to customizing machine or code, they might have to come to see their own bodies as the next appealing challenge, especially if they already felt uncomfortable with the gender they were born with. Now hacking, as a term for a type of cyborg insurgency, recodes the idea of matrix as womb, according to the overriding insistence that biology is not destiny. The matrix is transsexed in the same way as the body is prosthetically reorganized. And just as the body itself becomes reconceived as a prosthesis of the matrix rather than vice versa, so gender becomes conceived prosthetically as a distributed network of codes. I'll take a, a couple of examples of exploration of these issues in art practice. In Linda Dammit's art installation, Cyberflesh Girl Monster, from 1995, bodies that matter are recoded in a macabre Frankenstein comedy of gender panic. For the 1995 Adelaide Festival, about 30 women donated parts of their bodies um, by scanning them uh, and recording digital uh, sound uh, to accompany each of those scans. From these, conglomerated bodies were created animated and made interactive, becoming part of an ongoing morphological process. So is it an attempt to depict what we're talking about? But then we go further. Perhaps one of the best known exponents of interactive body transformation is the Australian artist Stellark. You have the, the third arm piece, Evolution, um, on one side. Now that prosthetic third arm is activated by electrodes attached to his abdomen. Okay, so it's again recoding the body to perform uh, certain sorts of functions. And down here you have ping body uh, where his body is wired up uh, to uh, the internet and operated by users in different remote sites. Okay, he's short circuiting the uh, intentional uh, relation between mind and bodily actions. Now, since the 80s, Stellark has explored the possibilities of human cybernetics in a series of dramatic works, from the third arm prosthesis of evolution and ping body to the surgical implantation of a third ear in his forearm in 1997. But perhaps his most striking work is his 2005 collaboration with Nina Sellers, entitled Blender. For Blender, both artists undertook liposuction operations using the resultant biomaterials as the substance of an installation piece, 1.6 metres high and anthropomorphic in scale and structure. Every few minutes, Blender automatically circulates or blends these biomaterials via a system of compressed air pumps and a pneumatic actuator. 
The mixture includes 4.6 litres of subcutaneous fat taken from Stellarx torso and Nina Sellers limbs, xylocaine, local anaesthetic, adrenaline, O positive blood, sodium bicarbonate, peripheral nerves, saline solutions, and connective tissue. Now, installed under a single dramatic spotlight, Blender is also wired for sound, amplifying, distorting, and delaying the audio produced by the blending mechanism itself. The project is an inevitable outcome of Stellark and Seller's long-standing fascination with alternative corporeal architectures and the blending of contemporary technology with corporeality. A blender reprises in part the dream or nightmare of an inanimate matter, body waste, effluvia, G-slime, made animate by means of some sort of diabolical apparatus injected with code, like growing a brain in a jar or a fetus or conjuring a new species from an evolutionary cyber swamp, a matrix of mutated cell structures becoming the armature of a future artificial intelligence, perhaps. If the golem is an allegory of the productive harnessing of the formless, of the ordering of chaos, of creation as work, it also points ahead to a general evolutionary potential that is far removed from the sublime conception of a transcendental god, even of a machine god. It points rather to a radical materiality in the transmissional codes, the reproductive potential of form, which is also to say the potential of agency which resembles us only insofar as we remain integrated into its circuit. Thank you.